Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, I mean, so you're getting a sense in these early shows, I'm sort of, I don't want to say regurgitating some things that we did earlier, but uh, I had to get some shows done pretty quickly. Um, but, but how wonderful it is to just sh focus an hour on Chopin and, and his, and his music. Um, you know, the, the first recording, do we remember Arnaldo Cohen? From the series? Mm -mm, I don't know who that is. He was a very, again, I, I had the uh, benefit. He was also on the roster of the, of the management company that I worked for. He was a, he's still alive. He teaches at Indiana University now, but he was a Brazilian pianist and has this incredible technique. And he came to the States for his recital debut tour and he was brutally assaulted in New York where he was hospitalized. <sighs> And, and never came back, came back, you know, he was coaxed back here in his, I think he was in his late fifties and then started his career up again. And that's when uh, he appeared on the series. He just, he just vowed he would never come back to New York, uh, to the United States. And he's, he's really, I mean, I, I, when I worked in Philadelphia too, we presented him as well, just really, really wonderful, wonderful pianist, especially in, in uh, Chopinalist um, repertoire, but we we had we had a question early. Maureen asked, like, wasn't Liszt a virtuoso, and how can you compare the two? I mean, how do I know? But but Liszt Liszt the difference, as I had said, I mean, Liszt was Liszt was sort of like Paganini, where you know Paganini was the real first real virtuoso, where you know people swooned over him. And you know the ladies were swooning all left and right, and that happened with with Liszt. And Liszt concertized all over Europe constantly. And as I said in the show, Chopin didn't concertize that much. But, he didn't um, have the stamina for it, did he? That yes, and that was a large large yeah. reason for it too. But he also was a very shy, reserved man, and didn't he didn't have the Liszt was this huge personality. They were quite different humans. And you see that, you know, in comparing the, the virtuosi, the, the technical demands on both their, their music. Um, Liszt's, Liszt's music, the piano music, is quite difficult to play, on par with, with Chopin, and many pieces hard, much harder than Chopin. Um, but he was never really, he always had a chip on his shoulder about being revered as a composer in his lifetime, Liszt. Whereas Chopin was really adored across the board. His, his compositions and, and his playing were just, they, he, he was beloved um, during his short lifetime. And I, I alluded to a, a, you know, they had a complicated relationship. I mean, the Opus 10 etudes were dedicated to Liszt. Um, and Liszt got uh, Chopin, Chopin's music published. He introduced him to a, a music publisher but there, there was a very competitive edge to them because they were these two, you know, the great pianists of, of that period. So there, was, there were egos involved where Chopin didn't feel this music was really uh, heartfelt. He thought it was very, very technically demanding, but didn't feel like it had a lot of soul. And um, I have a quote here, a rather long quote from Liszt um, and again, the, the Opus 10 Etudes, that was the first, um, that was the first selection uh, tonight. Uh, Chopin published them in, in um, 1833, 23 years old, short, you know, a couple years after he arrived in Paris. So here's a list on, on Chopin's personality. The Polish word, zal, as if, as if his ear thirsted for the sound of this world which expresses the whole range of emotions produced by an intense regret through all the shades of feeling from hatred to repentance. He repeated it again and again. Susceptible of different regimens, it includes all the tenderness, all the humility of regret, born with resignation and without a murmur, while bowing before the fiat of necessity, the inscrutable decrees of providence, but changing its character and assuming the regimen indirect as soon as it is addressed to man it signifies excitement, agitation, rancor, revolt full of reproach, premeditated vengeance, menace never ceasing to threaten if retaliation should ever become possible. 
feeding itself meanwhile with a bitter if sterile hatred. So he felt like, you know, Chopin always had this regret, but it was all tangled up and he expressed this regret through this myriad of emotions. And I, I don't know if to go so far as, as a sterile hatred, a bitter sterile hatred, but, um, but he, he paints a picture of, of a man who was very sort of difficult to read. And that sort of was Chopin's MO. He kept to himself. He kept his opinions to himself um, and was and basked in the adoration and adulation from his contemporaries. Like I, I, I alluded to it um, when we spoke of him, when I, when I did the program on Iconoclast, you know, and I quoted Schumann, Schumann adored Chopin and it wasn't mutual, but Schumann never knew that. Schumann, Schumann never knew it. So he's a, it was an in interesting, complicated man. Um, you know, these, it was interesting. So we had Arnaldo Cohen start the evening and then we had the mazurkas, the three mazurkas and performed by Jonathan Biss, which I mean, Jonathan's been to the series a number of times. Would you associate Jonathan Biss with Chopin? Mm. He doesn't really play a lot of Chopin. It's very, it's very, um, very mm. unique. I mean, I thought he played them beautifully, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but he, he doesn't, that's not really where he's focused his, his repertoire. And it was curious in that in this whole recital, he only approved the Chopin for broadcast. Oh, yeah. So it's, it was very, very uh, unusual and unique. And when I saw that, I said, aha, I have to include that. I have to include the mazurkas. So does anybody know what a mazurka is? Well, it's, it's a dance. I mean, it's a Polish waltz. Three, Polish four. waltz. So it's a, yeah. it's a Polish dance, but it's in three, it's in three times, just like a yeah. waltz. Yeah. So that's exactly what it is. It's a Polish waltz. The uh, very, on the second beat. And the emphasis, the on, the emphasis on the second beat. Correct. Correct. Um, so, so, you know, these mazurkas, like, you know, the, these are these character pieces and dances that, that Chopin had brought into the repertoire uh, and made them a regular part of the repertoire. Um, the, the Polonaise of, of Blehash, what do we think about that? The heroic, it's the heroic Polonaise. It's one of the most popular well, no. Chopin pieces. What'd you I think? Like the use of dynamics and the acceleration in those downward arpeggios in the, towards the end, it just was amazing. And then the drop down to pianissimo right before the end was stunning. That's right. You're right, right on Gary. He, so, you know, this is the beauty of hearing different interpretations. And, and um, this is why I bring Blayhosh back on a regular basis, almost every other year. I find his shaping and, and his voicing in his piano playing to be quite unique and wonderful and, in, and especially excelling in, in Chopin. And it was funny because this, this particular performance was his first performance with us. And I believe I mentioned a while ago that, you know, this is, he won, he eventually won the Gilmore Award, which is the MacArthur Award for pianists. And the, and the jury was in our hall listening to this performance uh, of, of, um, of Blehash's. And since it was his first tour and he, he'd won the Chopin competition, he had a recording contract with Deutsche Grammophon, Chopin, Chopin, Chopin. His ma he, he was trying to convince his manager that he should do some other repertoire when he came to, his, to the first, his first United States tour. And his manager said, no, you're nuts, play Chopin. <laughs> <laughs> so the, whole, the entire second half of this program was, was Chopin. And wow, and it was and really wonderfully played, very unique voicing, unique dynamics. His interpretation was, was really, it's you know, not your standard, um, heroic polonaise for sure but that you spoke about that gary about the the pianissimo when he dropped down a pianissimo toward the end of that it was just breathtaking yeah and, and the use of rubato was just yeah. it's also 
extraordinary. Absolutely. Roboto without too much. It was all very, yeah. like what I appreciate about him, it's very, um, he's very tasteful. It's never over, overdone. It's, and sometimes even subtle, like maybe too subtle for some, but I, I really appreciate that about his playing. Um, the heroic Polonaise, if we recall when I had spoken about Chopin earlier, that Chopin hated these titles. He thought the music should stand on its own and, and hated program music, didn't want any titles uh, associated with his music. But here's where the title comes from. I have, a, I have a quote from someone named George Sand, who's a very good friend, <laughs> as we had said previously. So Just George Sand friend. said, quote, the inspiration, the force, the vigor, there is no doubt that such a spirit must be present in the French Revolution. From now on, this Polonaise should be a symbol, a heroic symbol. And that's why it's called the heroic. It was from George Sand. Now, I, I, was, I was being cheeky about, you know, before we had said they were very good friends. So Chopin was actually in a relationship with George Sand for 10 years, from uh, 1837 to 1847. And he passed away in uh, 1849. So they, they had an impassioned affair and, and, and they traveled. There's a famous trip that they went to Mallorca when he was, um, and they had some problems with their accommodations and they stayed in this abandoned seminary and it was cold and damp and it really exacerbated uh, Chopin's symptoms from, the, from supposedly tuberculosis. And he got very, very ill. And, um, George, George Zand around toward the end of their relationship, and I'll think this is how their relationship kind of ended. She wrote a book called, I wrote it down, uh, Lucrezia uh, Fior Fioriani, Lucrezia Fioriani. And there's a character in the book that's a, an Eastern European prince who's very sickly, who is cared for by a young actress. And the young actress bemoans her fate to be in love with this sickly uh, Eastern, Eastern European Eastern. prince. So this book came out and it was obviously Chopin and that sort of uh, dampened uh, their feelings for one another. But then um, George Sand had, had a daughter who they had a falling out over money and Chopin continued um, to be friendly with her. And George Sand sit, considered it to be completely disloyal and accused him of being in love with her, with her daughter and then just broke off, broke off the uh, relationship entirely. So, ten years is you know, quite a quite a bit of time, especially in his short life. So they they were very important, and and the bulk of the pieces tonight were written. All of them except for the etudes were written during their relationship. The course of their relationship. So. Very very interesting. Um. We, and then we had Manny Axe play the, sh the scherzo. And um, that was, it was an older recording. It was 2003, I think, it was a performance. And that's one, one of the tech, more technically demanding scherzi um, that Chopin wrote, but it's in a sort of calmer setting, not so much a, a scherzo and dance setting. So it's, 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 this piece is also like unusual for the evening, but I thought Axe played it tremendously. Oh, I forgot before I moved to that. I have a picture, sorry, of George Sand uh, and, and, and Chopin. Um, and this is from a painting, an unfinished painting uh, by Delacroix. Mm. Mm. So there, there's that. Oftentimes the, the head is, is cropped uh, and used uh, quite a bit for, for Chopin, but that's a painting by Delacroix. Now, we ended the evening with a nocturne. And I said in the, in the, in the show that the etudes, that, that Chopin really brought uh, the etudes to the fore in the concert hall. He was the first one, you know, an etude was a, was a, was a study, a piano study before, before he made it a legitimate concert hall piece. But um, the nocturne was not his invention. Does anybody know who invented the nocturne? No. 
They're interesting. So was it there field? was. An, sorry? Was it Field? John Field? That's exactly who it was. Well done, Brian. John Field, who was Irish, an Irish uh, pianist and composer uh, in the early 19th century. He started, um, I think his first nocturnes were published in around 1808, 1810. And he, he had great admirers and Chopin being one of them. And Chopin took that form of the nocturne and just made it um, very, very, very popular. So uh, you should uh, look out for a go to YouTube um, and uh, seek out John Field's um, nocturnes. Um, they're lovely and they're very similar sounding in a sense to, to Chopin. Derek, why is it called a nocturne? What's the basis of that anyway? Well, it's, it's supposed to be a sort of night setting, a nocturnal setting. Okay. I mean, that's, that's really the, 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 the crux of, of, the, of what it should be. Whether, whether Chopin goes beyond that, it's arguable. Yeah. Okay. Yes, Robin. <laughs> when I was pregnant with a child, we got... Not hearing you. It's a little broken up. Okay. Um, when I was my first child, we bought Chopin Nocturne to play to the child, our daughter in, in utero. Can you hear? A little bit. So when your daughter was born, you bought a, a CD of Nocturne? No, when I was pregnant with her, we bought it and I played it while she was in utero. Mm. Wow. <laughs> oh, wow. That's good. That's wonderful. It's wonderful. They're 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 beautiful pieces. I mean, there's there's you know they're beautiful little gem gems of pieces. These nocturnes. Eric, can I ask a, a question? Sure. Yeah. When when um, when I listen, I think I'm not alone. Uh, of course, every composer has his own voice and his distinctiveness. But the sometimes some have the feeling as soon as you hear a measure of Chopin. You know it's Chopin and couldn't be anybody else. Is that is that a general feeling that people have? And was that appreciated during by his contemporaries as well? That the stuff that he produced was really uh, had a unique voice. Um, yeah, absolutely, David. I mean, when we when we focused on our show in the iconoclast, there's a reason why he I considered him an iconoclast, and there's a reason why I. I uh, entitled this this piece as as the Polish iconoclast romantic iconoclast, his 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 voice is unmistakable. When I played that recording, we played a blind recording of, I forget what um, it could have been this heroic polonaise the last time. I think time. it was. Yep. Everyone just Chopin, bam, Chopin, unmistakable. And I think that here he was. What you speak to during as his contemporaries that he was a novelty for sure. He came from East, Eastern Europe and, and had this singular voice with that virtu, virtuosity um, that was highly um, unique at the time. I don't think there's any question. I mean, when I, 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 I love that quote, which was unattributed to a person, but someone in attendance of his, of his first concert saying he killed them all, he killed all the pianists dead, you know, <laughs> with, his, with his first step in, into Parisian culture. I mean, it's just, you know, there are not many people that can make an entrance like that. So, no, I think he, he has this, a very, very, very singular voice. And, you know, as we spoke to it uh, previously, most all in the piano literature, with the exception of, we, we had mentioned the cello sonata and the piano trio. Um, you know, the, the, it's from, from the first measure, you know it's Chopin. There's some, you can, sometimes have some issue between Chopin and Liszt, very rare occasions, I'd say, where it's kind of hard to discern them. Um, Liszt, I would say, tends on the hyper-virtuosic, where there's just like a billion notes, <laughs> like in smoke coming off the keyboard, which was sort of the aesthetic um, that he was going for. But, um, but no, really Chopin with that, with that flavor of Poland uh, throughout everything, and I and 
you know, I, I said panache, but there's an elegance associated with, with um, him and his music. Even in the most virtuosic of passages, it's, it's very elegant. You mentioned Liszt again, and I've been mulling that quote that you, that you had. And I'm not knowing, I'm not a, certainly not an expert on Liszt or Chopin, but it sounds like that quote is more about Liszt than it is about Chopin. I, I believe so too. I believe so too. There were two other quotes that I, I was going to pull, but I thought this one was most interesting because of that reason. It's, it, I think it gives you a tinge of that competitive nature uh, between them. And that's why I chose it. Derek, there's a, there's a famous story that I can't remember exactly how it happened or exactly the story, but it was uh, at a, uh, an evening uh, concert in somebody's, in somebody's sitting room um, when Liszt and Chopin were there and Chopin, uh, Liszt demanded that they both play a piece by the other. And um, in, his, in his introduction, Liszt said, so we need to see if, we all know that Liszt can be Chopin, but can Chopin be Liszt? And that was his challenge. And of course, uh, I, I don't know how it actually turned out, but I'm sure what Chopin did just a fine job. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's harder to go from one one way than the other, for sure. But the competition was pretty, pretty was pretty fierce. Yes, yes, and then you know, List is the one who helped him in his career when he first got there, and also wrote wrote um, the first biography of Chopin after Chopin died. So yeah, very very complicated, very competitive for sure. I mean, Liszt was considered a god, you know, in, in the 19th century, and he had such a long life that his influence, you know, just stretched throughout the, the 19th century. He passed in the 1880s, I believe. Um, and if you listen to some of, you know, I, I, I haven't mind how much repertoire I have recorded of Liszt uh, at the series. I'm sure that I have a good, a good amount of it. But if you look to his late works, uh, specifically, there's a piece, Nuage Gris, Great Clouds, that's almost atonal. It's very spare. It's, if you just dropped a needle on that piece, I would doubt that most people would guess it was Liszt. It's an incredible work. And that speaks to where chromaticism was going. And Liszt, as I said, he was in that camp of chromaticism. Uh, with Wagner and, and going forth. So it got so chromatic that there was no, almost no tonal center, even in Liszt's time. In, in the, in the, I believe that was written in the last year of his life, actually, that piece, if not the last three years of his life. So really, really, really good stuff. But if you hear, you know, like the, and this is the problem with Liszt in that it's often played like a technical etude because it's so hard and there's not a lot of musicality that comes out of it. And some people would argue that there's not much musicality in it. But um, we had a performance in, uh, I believe it was 1617 with Paul Lewis, who is certainly not known for Liszt, but he did the, a performance of the Dante Sonata to close the program. And it was the most, I hate that piece in general. <laughs> I don't think it's much of a piece at all. But it was because of how I've always heard it. He made music out of out of this, out of the Dante Sonata, and it was just a marvelous performance, a marvelous performance. So I should I should play that. But any any performance that I heard of the of the um, of the of that piece was just, you know, basically a lot of notes and loud, and soft and loud and a lot of notes. <laughs> I didn't really really care for it too much. So, but um, but. He was, you know, I, I think that Liszt had some great skill in his writing and orchestration, you know, the, like Le Prelude, his, um, you know, those, those orchestral works, I, I, I think they're wonderful. I, I, like the, I like the piano concerti as well. The orchestration of the piano concerti, I think are much more successful than Chopin's piano concerti. But that's me. Um, any other thoughts about tonight? And the program? No. Thanks, thank, thanks for bringing us Chopin. I mean, it's really, it's really wonderful to hear that music. And some it is. really it's fine performances. So. Yeah.
it's you know that's the thing john it's you know they're de it's delightful repertoire and in the right hands especially so and to hear maniacs play those pieces uh and that nocturne is not done very often and he played it as an encore on that program uh, and it was a different program than 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 the one i chose from the scherzo i it was just marvelous marvelously played marvelous that that program that you pick pick that piece the Manny piece from was that the one when he did Bawad's uh, Brahms and Chopin Bawad's? No, it was no that 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 program. I don't have the have the disc for, and I'm very I'm very sad about that. <laughs> but uh, no, this was a mixed program uh, that was later than the Bawad program. I think by two years, uh, off the top of my head, I can't remember. Because that Bawad's program was really wonderful. It was yeah. a, a classic Manny. Classic Manny. No, he's he's. We're lucky to have him, yeah. Nevia, did you have something? That it's just an aside and it's not musical. Uh, <laughs> um, when, whenever we get to travel again, maybe some of us will be able to go back to Paris where there is a museum of the romantic life, the Musée de la Vie Romantique. And they have, it's mostly uh, one section of it about the life of George Sand, but George Sand, but they have, um, a plaster cast of Chopin's left hand, and also I believe some letters and and things that that they exchanged uh, other in other articles that they exchanged while they were together. So it's kind of an interesting place to get a little bit of an inkling of that time period. There's furniture and other things, uh, and of their life together. Actually, wonderful. Thank you. Thanks for letting us know. Yeah. <laughs> Derek else? Or, 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 yeah, Derek or any of the others. Um, I mean, Chopin's one of my absolute favorite composers. Um, I didn't come to him until, you know, sometime in my adulthood, and then and he's moved really to the to the top, and I love him. One thing my ear struggles with is kind of like the difference between, you know, kind of individual phrases and overall line, and the degree to which one or the other, you know, like the balance essentially between the two. Um, you know, I'll, I'll find sometimes that, uh, I mean, so many of his phrases are incredible, but then it's real. It, it can be really easy to lose yourself, like in the beauty of a phrase. And my ear wants to say sometimes that it's at the expense of, you know, forward momentum. I, but I don't know that there's like, you know, like any hard and, and, and fast rule. Um, I mean, I've heard some recordings where, again, like a particular, you know, a particular phrase just sounds fantastic, but it seems like the overall kind of momentum just like slowed to a to a halt. And I and I don't know if that's you know something that I you know and and just looking for just kind of like an overall line and and just like keep things going. I've heard waltzes sometimes play just very tugging you know you know kind of pull and and, and tug where I'm kind of wondering isn't it a waltz? Isn't it a dance? Isn't there supposed to be some kind of underlying movement? I don't, I don't know if, if, if you or the others, like is there a right or wrong or is there just so much flexibility in Chopin that it's, you know, unless you do something really extreme, it, it's, it's okay? Anyone before I go? <laughs> Brian, it's an excellent question. I think um, what I was speaking to about Blayhosh is playing in the, when I speak to about the voicing. And what that means is that, you know, when Chopin is going, this usually the melody is very simple. I don't want to generalize, but it's simple, but it's embellished in the other in the other fingers quite a bit. There's a lot going on with it with with the notes. And Chopin doesn't keep the tune in one, like for instance, the soprano voice on the top line. He doesn't continue it all the way through. He'll start there and then he'll pass it interior and then have embellishments above. And then it will go and then it will go down to the bottom. So it's a matter of the pianist being able to bring out these lines and to lessen the embellishments and, and the other things that are that are going around. So sometimes it's hard to trace the the linear um, aspect of a phrase in Chopin. Does that make sense? It does. Does everyone know what I'm speaking about? Mm -hmm. It's very easy when you have accompaniment in the on the left hand and the and the tune is just going here like this, then it's very very easy to hear what's happening, but he's passing the tune all through the middle fingers, middle register, while the upper register is doing something else, and 
and constantly just weaving it in and out of, of the um, keyboard. And it's really the pianist's job and with the pedaling and the technique and the, and the voicing and bringing out those lines that should be brought out that, that um, is so important for the listener. And what I was speaking to about Blehash is that he does that even more where he's bring, in my opinion, he brings out lines that I've really never been aware of before, brings out harmonies within the lines that, that support the line um, that I find to be really, really unique. But uh, I think that's what it is. If you pull Chopin apart, if you just chopped out the tune, the tunes are very straightforward, very, very straightforward. He's just being very co complicated in harmony and embellishment around the tune that makes it so marvelous. Yeah, does that make sense? It's a nuance, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very good question because that's, you know, when in any, in any repertoire, that's the case with pianists. It's not just going plunk, 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 plunk. They've got to bring out the voices, the internal voices, the harmonies and, and things like that. And just, you know, emphasize one finger over another finger, put more pressure on, on the keyboard with one finger than another finger to bring out those, those, those voices. That's why I always say, you know, the piano is the, is the easiest instrument to play. All you do is whack the key and you got a note. Anybody can do that. But it's really about the coloration of those notes that really makes the, a pianist, uh, you know, play this percussion instrument essentially. And I think uh, Gary had mentioned before the the uh, the significance of the rubatos, uh, the way they were, the way he handled the rubatos. I mean, I think that's for me that's particularly important in Chopin. Absolutely, no question. Whereas, you know, when I would say like, you know, with Mozart and, Be and Mozart and Haydn, not so much, but in 19th century repertoire, absolutely. The push and pull of the line is vitally important uh, in this repertoire, vitally important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So- Inner voices, bringing that, because that's one thing I really liked about the Blayhosh interpretation. I, I heard things well, again, I'm not an expert, but I heard things that I've never noticed before in, his, right. in, the, in the music. That's exactly, I, I mean, I couldn't agree with that more. And that's what I really, uh, I really appreciate that about his playing. And he's like that in all repertoire, not just Chopin. Um, and, you know, one could argue it's sometimes it's more successful than other times, but I appreciate the approach. I like that he's thinking about harmony in his in his melodies and how the harmony uh, either emphasizes or de-emphasizes what's happening in the melody. I find it to be very very interesting, and that's why I'm a, a fan and bring continue to bring him back to the series. That's great. Yeah, he doesn't have you know, Blayhash does not have a big career in the states. He plays a lot in Europe. Um, I've been. I've been championing him and he's been doing things, but you don't see him playing Carnegie Hall. You don't see him, you know, playing with the big orchestras yet, you know, but I really appreciate his musicianship. How old is he, Derek? Oof. Um, he is, I would say 35 to 40. 35 to 40. And then he went back to school. He won the Gilmore. What he did with the Gilmore money, I think it was a quarter of a million dollars. He bought a piano for himself. And, uh, and then he went back to school in Poland and got a doctorate of philosophy. He's an interesting guy. I, I really, I really uh, appreciate him. And I'm glad I keep talking about him because I have one more selection from him <laughs> to play for you. Uh, anything else about the show before I play? Great, Great. show. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I, I uh, from that early um, October four, uh, 2014 performance where the second half was all Chopin, uh, I want to play for you his performance of the uh, of the three waltzes, Opus 64, and you will know some of these <laughs> for sure. So here's Rafael Blehash in uh, the three um, waltzes, Opus 64. Here we go. Thank you. 
What'd you think? I was just going to uh, comment because I, I listened carefully to what Brian was saying before and the skillful way that Blechash uses the adjustments of tempo so that when he uses the rebato artfully, he's never self-indulgent, so it doesn't lose that shape and that, um, that forward motion. But it doesn't, it doesn't uh, stop him from giving the phrases in their beauty their due, but he always, with good taste, manages to move on and to resume tempo and to just the right tempo to go on. So I think that's the way he handles the the child that you were talking about, Brian, about, you know, the the um, absorption into particular beautiful phrases as a kind of uh, <clears throat> as a kind of balancing off against the the momentum of the of the piece and the shape of the piece in the larger sense. I think he does that did that just magnificently. And and I was also hearing what uh, what what both you and, and, and Guy were saying about hearing voices that one doesn't normally hear and i was listening for that and i was noticing that too in this in these performances really fabulous i think that's an important concept in, in music in general is that it's always forward mo moving and that it just stretches the time stretches but it never goes back and what happens oftentimes with rabati is that thing motion stops and it stagnates and that's, that's a really good point. And it's, um, you know, tasteful rubati, it's just, there's nothing better about it. Untasteful rubati, there's nothing worse than it because it's just, it just, the piece falls apart. So yeah, I, I couldn't agree with that sentiment more. Yeah. Yeah, to repeat what both of you said, um, it's gonna sound silly, but like it, it really kind of crystallized in my head. Like my favorite Chopin interpretation is tipsy but it's not like sloppy drunk, where I mean like there's, there's a certain unpredictability to Chopin that I absolutely love. And then and this pianist seems to nail and, you know, anytime he's playing, whether it's the body, whether it's the different colors, he can come up like the second waltz to me, um, you know, really had it where, you know, you're going to hear the same sort of, you know, phrases over and over again. But I mean, he brought like a, a different color to, to many of them. The legato was beautiful sometimes, other times it was, you know, just very short and, you know, whether that's staccato or, or another term. Um, yeah, like just the unpredictable, the unpredictability, you know, of, of Chopin, you know, really appeals to me. And I guess when you're performing it, um, you know, bringing that out and, and stretching it without breaking, kind of breaking it is, is, is the challenge. And when it's done well, like, you know, tonight, it's, it's I love it. I like the question of unpredictability. Um, I, I wonder how close these pieces are to improvisation, how, how, how close they are to Chopin just sitting down and just wailing away on the piano and saying, oh, I think I'll keep that. It's an interesting, I think there's a lot of that, I mean, if I were to speculate. But I would also go back to what Brian had said, is that, you know, um, rubato musicianship takes discipline. And that's what makes it the difference between it being tipsy and a sloppy drunk. There has to be, there has to be some discipline in applying these techniques in, in interpretation. And, and that's, that speaks to it. And, you know, when he, when you hear music like that, and, and again, Brian, there was an excellent point. Each time the tune came back, he did something different. Each time he colored it, it was piano. He took some time, you know, it was just, he did, it was never the same. And just all, all that, nothing crazy, right? There was nothing, you know, you're like, oh, what, what's he doing? Or like shocking, but he just colored it differently each time. It was so wonderful, especially in the second one, especially in the second one. So if there is something of the improvisational in Chopin's creation of these pieces, there certainly was nothing improvisational about Blechash's performance. I mean, everything was, was planned. He knew what he was going to do each time, and oh, and studied, and and that's why it it worked so perfect. I, I also, you know, those dynamic shifts when all of a sudden from a uh, kind of bold, not not particularly forte, but a mezzo forte to a uh, to the mezzo piano restatement of the theme. It just 
I, I thought it was exquisite. Yep. And that's the thing you don't, you know, you don't hear that technique. You don't hear the plan, you know, and that's, that's important. Is that it's no, there, no, but it's. Oops, sorry. No, no, I'm just, I was, go ahead, Ray. The very first of the waltzes went by, sounded to me like a whirlwind. So I was wondering, of course, you can play at any tempo you want, but has this been played classically by various, by various performers, always at the same rate? Are there others that we played much slower and others played faster? How much leeway, liberty do we have in the well, tempo design? It's interesting that you choose that particular waltz because the, the name requires it to be played in a certain amount of time. That's a joke. It's the minute waltz, the first one. <laughs> <laughs> no, the answer to the question is if you know it's it has you have to follow the instructions, right? As best that you you know uh, the the performer is tasked always with communicating what the composer intends and yeah, providing. I, I understand that Bach gave very little guidance as correct play. And he left it to the performance. And uh, so I wonder why, how closely a performer is allowed to deviate from the instructions, if you will. Depends on his colleagues or her colleagues. Um, yeah. yeah, it's an excellent question. And that's what I mean about being disciplined. There are certain, um, I don't want to just lend it to performance practices, but stylistic. Um, necessities to approach a uh, repertoire in a certain way. Um, comparing Bach to Chopin, that's, you know, they're very far apart. Yeah, yeah. Chopin notated, Chopin notated these uh, Celerandi and, and, and um, Rubati and, and uh, Ritardandi. He notated all that. Bach rarely, you know, Bach, Bach has spare dynamic markings, whereas Chopin has very clear dynamic markings. Yeah. But in a way, there's a parallel with Bach that if you talk about the distinctiveness of Chopin, the other composer you think of, that as soon as you hear a measure of, of the music, you can pretty well know it's Bach, even though, you know, he's, he's working in the, in the, in the uh, Baroque language. Mm -hmm. but, the, but somehow you have that same sense. As soon as you hear a couple of measures of it, you know that it's, that it's Bach. Can I ask you one of the questions since you m mentioned this question of minute waltz? I had understood that uh, minute was was uh, was a misunderstanding that it was really a mi minu that it was a small waltz and then it was interpreted as having played in a minute. But that was a, a later on um, interpretation. But that was not what the original appellation was. Is that just not not correct? I honestly don't know. I only learned this. I I learned that one from Bugs Bunny. <laughs> <laughs> a great teacher, by the way. Yes, <laughs> but um, and 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 in any, I don't know that the answer to that, and I can I can I can look into that. That's possible, but and nonetheless, it's not due to um, Chopin. Chopin did not put any headings on his pieces. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Well, thanks again for joining. Thank, Thank you very much again for doing this. Thank Next you, week, we, we focus on Leos Janacek, an entire hour of Janacek. So I'm really oh, and I can't be that. here. Oh, uh oh, uh oh. Um, so we're I'll looking at his um, a uh, few of his piano pieces uh, in the midst. We're doing um, Lottie, the wind sextet, and the complete uh, intimate letters quartet. Oh, yeah. You're killing me. You're killing me. <laughs> I try. What can I say, Greg? I try. <laughs> I Sorry, go I can't make it. I gotta In go any wait case, next week. I hope everybody has a good night. Thanks again for joining me. Everybody, thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Derek. Okay, okay, so long. Bye bye. Thank you, Derek. Bye. Bye. Bye bye, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Ray. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.